Well, can I give you all a, a really big welcome to the Buddhist Society? Um, this is a really, very really special occasion where we're going to look at uh, a wonderful book that's been published. And this book is very important for a number of reasons. Anyone who is new to Buddhism wants to learn something about Buddhism, really the core of the teachings, would be well advised to read this book. And I only wish that when I'd started out as a young student of Buddhism, instead of reading lots of philosophy, I could have got hold of a book like this, it would have saved me years of, 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 of practice, because it's very, very clear what Buddhism is actually about, the transformation of the human heart. But we will be beginning in just one moment or two. But what I would say is please, um, during this lockdown period, when everyone's been away, do think about giving, um, being generous in giving things to Sammy Ling and uh, up there in Scotland where they, they need funds and they need help. And also to the Buddhist Society, also to join up and be our members and help also. But now it's my great pleasure and joy indeed to introduce our, our guest and a big welcome to you from all over the world. I know there are people here from South Africa and America and all over England, Scotland, Ireland, and, and our guest speaker, Lama Yeshe Losa Rinpoche, who is joining us from Sammy Ling in Eskadale Muir in Scotland. And we're going to be talking about his book, the book From a Mountain in Tibet. And it's the story of a young man who comes in contact with the Dharma and is transformed by it, but, and eventually ends up as the abbot of, of Sammy Ling Monastery. But it also covers historically the invasion of Tibet by the Chinese forces from 1959 onwards for the Yama Leshe's leaving of Tibet, his jo initially joining a monastery with his elder brother and then training in a monastery, and then the Chinese come ever closer, and then leaving with 300 people and crossing the Himalayas, where they lost almost their entire party. And I think out of the 300 that left, only about 13 arrived finally in India. And then all the things that happened to him in between. I don't want to take up too much of that time, but in the process of his long life, he's met some of the most important people in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, Trumpa Rinpoche, of course, um, his elder brother Akon, the Karmapa, Frida Bedi, who helped them when they came into India, um, the, the Karmapa, the, both Karmapas, 17th Karmapa and the 18th, the Dalai Lama. And really in the book, it covers the whole history of the Tibetan story including the most amazing, I think, almost miraculous thing of how a small refugee community came to the West to a completely new culture and really established themselves and have contributed enormously to the culture of the West. And I think that process has only just begun. And, uh, and I think reading this book is, you know, will make very clear what Tibetan Buddhism is about, because some people get confused by it and think it's very complicated, complicated philosophies and all sorts of deities and all goodness knows what. But actually, the story of, of really of a pilgrimage of the heart or the transformation of the heart is what it's really all about. Well, I'll hand over now to our speaker. Yeshi, thank you so very, very much for your time, for writing this book, giving it to us to read. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I bow down to Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and also this material, I know you very well. I came to your organization a few times. Your organization is oldest in the uh, United Kingdom, and you actually have gained respect of all the schools in uh, uh, Buddhism. So I think your job, you're doing most wonderful job. This time, because of, due to this corona disease, I would like to uh, sort of uh, uh, help all of you how you can manage. We should never, never feel sorry for ourselves. We should always uh, never leave 
our mind idle, we should always recognizing within our own self, they is called Buddha. And that's called Buddha mind within every one of us, every Buddha. So there is no higher or lower or rich or poor because due to human beings, greediness, we have somehow consumed so much energy without uh, thinking about future. So environmental is very, uh, going very widely wrong. So we, I have been insisting as a Buddhist, I never ever throw one spoon of food. I just take what I want, remaining no wastage. So I ask all of you, discipline number one, never to throw away any food. Then I look into six parameters. Out of all these six parameters of Buddha, Jimpa, Jimpa, Jimpa means giving, giving, giving. To give whatever you can give means giving is not only materialistic, time, space, energy. So this will help us to transfer from this big eye into others. I think the way we able to think of others more than one's own self, then that is more this end of our individual suffering. Because when Buddha's talking about arahat or the other traditional arahat or enlightenment means the more we think about the past, it's just nothing, it goes nowhere. It just keep on repeating same thing again and again. So I thought, I always say it's like spinning wheel. So you're not in charge of your mind. So you go to think about like indulging what has happened or not happened doesn't bring you any result. So we say never lead the future. If we are believers of empowerment, we don't even know what is coming even next hour to individually. So what is Buddha? It's not a Buddha that big golden statues or all this. Buddha means being in the present, not in the past, not in the past, future. Being present means no one of us could have any, any problem. So remembering it's based on giving, based on loving, kindness, compassionate, but most important of all, unconditional compassion. Unconditional means if normally in Europe, you have a problem say, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. This is called out of base uh, expectation. It doesn't have the true, genuine, authentic benefit. So we have to learn always unconditional, unconditional. So if we do this, then uh, I look into religion. There isn't any difference whether you follow Islam or uh, we call Christianity or different school of Buddhism, uh, there, there isn't anything different because it has to be all good. A religion of faith cannot be benefiting human beings if it's cause of our up evil in fight in differences. So religion faith means it is like healer. It does the healing job for all of us. So I really want this talk of mine can benefit all of you. So when you all talk about meditation, meditation normally uh, uh, our we call Buddha school, the other tradition, they say we should meditate on concentrating in our five sensory means uh, sort of test on <coughs> testing. So this is not normally going to be beneficial too much. This is a very good method for Europe in mind because you have a very active, very busy mind. So if you have something to engage, it does transform from just useless uh, way of thinking, then just taste on different 
formless form or uh, taste or untaste or different things. So it's very good. But true sense is we don't need to supplement any of this method, just be in the present. Meditation means don't try to sit long time because then soon you get boredom comes and it take, uh, keeps your mind busy. So meditation means be in the moment. You stay there as long as you can. The minute your mind starts to jump, then think how you're going to transform, how you're going to benefit others. So it's like uh, opening a new path, new avenue, not letting old way of going mind. So I really ask every one of you, just say, we were not going to argue based on faith or belief or gender or color. We're going to engage truly how to improve uh, self-improvement to improve others. And then every Buddha's teaching, whether it's His Holiness, Dalai Lama or Kamapa, every high Lama says, what you have to have is good, stable, loving, kind mind, then anything is possible. But if you have very stressful mind, very uh, busy mind, doesn't matter how much you like to help or be busy, you can never reach and help. So please remember, good, stable, calm, compassionate mind. This is a very simple. So my teacher says, even if you have it for one second, trying to build it upon, it's like habit. Just try again and again. Maybe gradually you can have a little more a minute and a second. You can keep on doing this. So you build this new habit. So when I talk, I keep on talking too much same time. So if this mean, or oh, every one of you think you have something to ask me, which could benefit uh, this whole uh, dialogue, I'm very uh, happy to accept questions. I, I think, yes, I think it would be, be very nice if we could ask you some questions about your book. Yes, okay, yes. I was very struck in reading your book about your early childhood. The fact that when you, the little village you were brought up in, everyone was completely living together. You know, the animals, the people, a small community, and everything was intimately connected. The clouds, the trees, the, the harvesting, the festivals, the seasons, the family, the children, the mothers, the aunts and uncles. And wanted to ask you about that effect on your life, what it did for you. I think is one of the most idyllic lifestyle. Actually, I can see now it's called uh, 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 Tindu, very, very middle of far end of China, Situn Xinjiang. One side is Chinese, there's a big river. One side, the Tibetans. These Tibetan nomadic, they have a very big black tent. They go on a, a very hilltop and they have a, uh, about 10, 20 animal milk uh, called ndr, female yak, and a mother and husband, children. They completely, totally contain happy. So in Tibet, after all this many years, there isn't much Chinese could change Tibetan mentality because we are not fighting uh, against, uh, you know, uh, bad world, bad world. We just keeping our own sort of tradition. I saw in this uh, Tindu, there's um, half of them are Chinese, half of them Tibetan. So when Tibetans the whole evening dancing, there isn't much thing to dance, just going round and round. All the Chinese are joining. They're also singing because now, because this uh, due to uh, Dalai Lama's, uh, uh, we call famous, being able to be helping and respect by around the world, doesn't matter. Communist Chinese can say he's evil or bad. Nobody inside Tibet or outside uh, listen to the Chinese. So now Tibetan nationalists 
around the world, whether they are inside China, outside uh, uh, China, they are all singing joyful songs, dancing, they are like a dharma. So in my place, uh, when I look into most beautiful, I can see I have now pictures. You may have that in one of my book there, and it is most beautiful. Uh, we have got right climate, so we have uh, avocado and all the fruits you can grow here. We never have to plant anything, but Tibet never bothered to do any of this because Andre uh, or Yag provide us milk, yogurt, uh, the uh, skin, everything we need, they provide us. So for me, losing that is uh, uh, will be worst thing you can ever lose that tradition. Then Dharma means Buddha, Dharma, Sangha means Buddha taught different methods, many, many methods. So uh, Sangha keep that method alive. Dharma means that doctrine of Buddha, what he taught the methods. So that's why nowadays Buddha, Dharma, Sangha is so precious. There's nothing new. Buddha says, even if I leave my body, uh, I have not left any of you because my wisdom method all is left for all of you to benefit. So no bigger country can ever subdue smaller country who have very rich, uh, we call culture based on compassion, loving kindness. So uh, young lamas, Rinpoches, even he is all in this Dalai Lama, they said, when they young, because we don't have any wisdom, teacher will give you a hard time. Because then you, the, the, when teacher give you a hard time, you can learn things so fast. When you learn things first, because the teaching says you should appreciate, you should have a gratitude, you should have appreciation to those teachers unconditionally uh, giving you the tools and the means to overcome such a difficult time. So, Chujang Tungba was my brother's uh, very, very good Dhamma friend. Previous Chujang Tungba and previous Akum, they were very teacher and a student to each other. And I escaped with him. So he was very tolerant. He was only two years older, so same as my brother's age. So actually he was more kinder to me than my own brother. If people knows my brother, he never says hardly anything. He is solid rock, see. But if he says one word, it's worth 1,000 words. And everybody, wherever I go, uh, anybody ever met him, they have an effect on him. So uh, I was rebelling against uh, all the things he have done to me. This is so, your. This is um. Yes. This was this was um Jamyang, your your elder brother. Uh, no, Jamyang is my oldest brother. Yeah. Uh, he was very kind. He was sent there to look after my uh, uh, this Tuku brother and myself. So Jamyang was the most kindest, most nicest human being. When my Akunrumbaj goes somewhere, I never study. I just play around and he says, please don't do that. When your brother comes back, he's going to give you a hard time. I never learned a lesson. So young children never have any wisdom. <laughs> so you just, even one hour you escape, then joy is better to be tortured. So uh, the luckily when Chinese come, this between my uh, school in a monastery and the Chinese no more than uh, two and a half hours, so we have to escape. I was so happy. I never been so happy. Chinese liberated me, see? <laughs> so I mean, we used to have very nice horses and I wear nice, ride on nice horses. And I, once I on the top of the horse, I never come down. And my older brother begging me saying, you have to come down because horse going down, up and down whole day, uh, uh, the, it's not good, but I never listened. So I was very weak, 
but stupid. So one day, horse went under the tree, and I was hanging up in tree bench. <laughs> so I've done many things wrong. So I came. Uh, uh, they, my brother, they found Johnson House. Then they named after the oldest monastery in Tibet called Samyi. I think they really have the wisdom because the Samyi in Tibet was started almost 2000 years ago, very early in Gurumbuche and the king of uh, Tibet. So it is still continuing serving Tibetan people. So Samyi in Europe, I assure you, will have similar benefit to European uh, culture tradition because I right now have about uh, 46 monks and nuns in Samyi locked down there. Uh, the Samyi is called now Kama Dujyu Tajiling Manusri. They are uh, taught, they've been uh, taught from one of the very land abbot in Nepal every day, two to three hours teaching from uh, Zoom or uh, teaching. And then evening or afternoon, they have to work very hard to plant enough vegetables so there's a self-sufficient. So sanghas are kept very busy in Nepal. We Mlarepa was once meditating. This about built a retreat place. There's about roughly hundred uh, students from around the world: Chinese, uh, Asians, Tibetans, even Congo black people. And there's uh, three, four young Congolese children. They are all taught by him. So the children are taught. Tibetan, Chinese, English, they would be linguistic and they have to go through very, very hard journey. So one day when they finish, after it's like uh, 12 years or 16 years of going through this indoctrination, mm -hmm. then they will be coming back to Samyili to serve uh, us as our uh, representative sending around the world because we say, knowing like to become like a, a professor you learn all the texture things but if you don't have through meditation experience then it becomes we call dry leaves so they have to meditate and truly know the experience and so it's like uh, they are really doing wonderful job so some healing will have a great future you, you describe very, very, sorry to bring you back to your book. You, you describe very eloquently, you know, your, your childhood and how, how the initiation into the monastery, how, how very difficult it was with this stern elder brother. And then your, and then your release from, from the monastery because the Chinese troops are coming ever closer. And then going, trying to go towards Lhasa and then you discover that Lhasa has fallen and the Dalai Lama has left and has crossed the Himalayas and is now in India, and then your own journey across the Himalayas. Would you would you like to just say something about that about that crossing? Yes, this is because we were going straight up to the Lhasa. Then they said the Dalai Lama has already escaped to India, so we almost have to go backward. So we almost came down almost uh, uh, near the uh, you know Bama. Uh, Brahmaputta River. Uh, so uh, we have to leave all our belongings and horses, everything, roughly more than 300 people. Then we came to where we have to cross the Brahmaputta River. It's coming into Assam. So the, uh, there was a big Zangpo uh, going down there. So Chujam um, Trungpa is old binoculars. So we're looking from the top on hill with the trees how we can cross from there. Then we had a, a young uh, monk coming from Kham. He knows how to make this leather caracus, small one. You can only take four or five people. So we have to make many of this in the forest, sewing it together because we have a, a, a yak skin bags to carry our provision. So we have to undo this and make this caracus. Then so, uh, waterproof this, uh, then there's uh, some glue like this uh, comes out from the pine tree. So we have to uh, pick up this and then 
finally, when we decided to cross the Tsangpo, uh, we have five lamas. And I was the youngest uh, 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 brother, and Tungpa Rinpoche have one attendant. We are crossed first by my brother and their secretary. So they thought they crossed us. They left us uh, near the river. They went back and then we hear Chinese shooting from every corner. And then Tungpa's old lama knows what's happening. I didn't know what's happening. So he got, uh, they have a relics box from uh, t up to 10th Tumba, very precious ones. He opened it up and put some on my neck and some on his neck. Then he took my hand and we went out across the uh, uh, other side, the uh, we call it riverside. But there was another water we didn't know where to cross. So I was wearing this sheepskin lamp and we have to go through this. It's completely soaking wet, middle of winter, frozen. But if you're so afraid of your life, you don't die. As soon as we cross there, then going into, we call uh, in more uh, where there's no sun, very high mountain climbing up and a lot of big trees. So we went under this hiding and the Chinese are shooting everywhere looking after everywhere. So they did catch all the men near the river and they're uh, tying them up and then sending up to Lhasa area to force uh, a road building. My older brother was so worried that Agun Rinpoche and I, myself will never be able to look after ourselves. So he pretend to be so sick he didn't eat food for one whole week. And then when everybody else going, uh, some nuns and children are allowed to go there to bake. Then he said, get more provision, like it was some healings, of course, Tibetan uh, stable food, tamba, and also look into, is there any easy road to go into this area? And they found something. So in the night, he said, one of these, God exchange, he rolled over to uh, where the uh, hays are. Uh, so he went under this, Janice didn't notice. Then in the night, he escaped with this nun and two, three young boys. And they, he went straight on the main road. In the meantime, Chujan Tumba Rinpoche, myself, my brother and old lamas, it took weeks to go up, then coming down, we ran out of food nothing to eat. So we have to uh, sort of uh, take off our shoelace, you know, it's leather uh, bottoms. So we have to chop it. And then they say, it will save you. They cook it and then we ask to chew it. But it made me more sick than uh, free me from hunger. So we went through almost a death stretch. And then gradually where we are going is called uh, Indians Assam. Uh, these people are very primitive. They can shoot you with a poison arrow or they can kill you. So we're going into where they could kill you or eat you up. And we have Chinese chasing from one end. There's no food we can eat. Then gradually the Indian army, they are carrying their, we call armies up there to make some sort of border a garrison. So I never ever experienced a petrochemical. I was so sick. And then they have this cargo airplane where they bring the armies, some cows and the, uh, the petrol. So they said, we're going to take you to Assam in this airplane. So this airplane doesn't have any seat. They all, we are all tied it in the uh, floor and we are all giving a plastic bag if we get sick. And so we, it was a torturing. And then we landed in Assam, so hot, the tarmac, if you put your feet, your feet get stuck there. So luckily, Sister Pama was there, sent by Prime Minister uh, uh, Nero to help Tibetan. And he took sympathize to 
Chujan Tumba and myself and my brother, if you look in the picture, there's a few of us there. And then she says, come to me and I'll teach you some English. So she used to give us some sweet tea and cookies. Chujan Tumba was very sharp. He is really has a brain. He managed to ask her her address, telephone number. So we are very lucky Dalai Lama uh, asked the Indian government if he can have 500 uh, monks in the college, Baksa means it's a very hot, hot place where the, uh, in English, he kept the very big criminals of uh, Indian citizens. So it's the worst place you can ever go. We are sent there. So uh, we, we were sent there then we are all completely sick, but we didn't need to wait so long because the Kamapa said, we can go up there. Remaining all the Tibetans are sent into a different part of India to do road building of Himachal Pradesh because Indians can't go up and make roads. So Tibetans are very useful. So when we were in Assam, then uh, we were sent into this monk's college I went there, it was so hot, good rice. They gave us a very old rice. There's worms in the rice. Then uh, we all got dead warm, is the long white thing in your stomach. Because that time I was very young. So young Kamba boys there, we have to get this uh, uh, petrol to get uh, burning our huh? paraffin. paraffin. He said, if we drink paraffin, uh, this it can get rid of the tap bomb. So we all took one glass of paraffin and it did the job. It didn't kill me. I got rid of the tap bomb. <laughs> but my older brother, he died there because of tobacco. Everybody was dying. So I was taken to Delhi. And my brother came back because they already with Sister Pamu. So we went there, then they started Young Lama Home School. That's how it happens. So Baksa, I saw this, Gilupa monks and all others, they stuck there almost 15 years. They said, then His Holiness Dalai Lama was very skillful saying, you go to uh, uh, South India, there's a very beautiful land. You can get everything you need, rice, food, everything. You can all go down there. So they said, they thought, that's very good, we better go there. He said, when they went there, there was nothing. It's all forest trees. So they have to cut the trees and plant the rice field for many, many more years. But then he's, this, this old monk says, there is wisdom because after that hard work, now we have some of the most biggest Gilupa monasteries, 10,000, 5,000 big temples, uh, big farming area. So Tibetans in that area is now very, very rich. So that's how t Tibetans, wherever they go, they manage to transform. You describe um, very eloquently, you know, that, 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 that crossing of the Himalayas, but it's very shocking to read, you know, for, for a Westerner, because I think there were 300 of you to begin with. And at the end, there's hardly anyone left. And then it seems that the early period in India, when you were with Frida Bedi and sent down, as you said, to Kerala and to these places, was also quite difficult. It wasn't exactly easy, but you know, you you survived it and you did very well. Actually, you carried on and you um, you know you kept your health, although you were in hospital for a while, weren't you? you caught TB and then they sent you away and you had an operation. Yeah. Well, what happens to the young lamas homeschool? There's a two high Gilupa Tukus. We got this, uh, uh, some sort of chicken pox or smallpox something. Then they taking us currently, they, they found we have got uh, tuberculosis. So then tuberculosis uh, sanitarium is uh, uh, somewhere in Rajasthan, very big, massive one there. So when we are taking there, uh, the, because my uh, TB was so bad, it's almost my lung is gone. So my left side, it's almost uh, no nothing there. So uh, one of the American volunteers there who came from USA, 
she really felt sorry for me. She said, I'll take you there and I'll pay whatever takes. So he will form operations. So when I found out, they cut almost my lungs off. But that time, such a bad way of doing it, I lost four or five ribs. They just cut the ribs off. Just like did I saw some other people when they operate, they treat like your kettles, you tied up your arms and just chop them with a <laughs> so like this. So <laughs> I lost all my decide. But <clears throat> due to my practice, I've been always straightening up. So unless I'm sleeping, they goes this way. Otherwise, I'm able to straight up. And even to such a hard situation. I didn't die. And then when I was in the hospital, my brother came to see me saying, look, I have asked someone else to look after you, Chu Jiang Tungbo, and we got a, a scholarship in Oxford. We're going there. When we are ready, I'll take bring you back to the United Kingdom. So then I stayed a few more years with Sister Pamo <coughs> with the Young Lama Home School. But I was a bad man. Sister <laughs> trying to teach me good, uh, good manner English teaching, I never listened to her because she want everybody to call her mummy and a mummy. I said, no, I'm not going to call you mummy. You're not my mummy. And then <laughs> she wanted to teach me English. I said, I don't need English. Then and uh, uh, with the young woman from school, maybe it's very big uh, going down in the valley. They is called Dal uh, Dalhousie. It's up uh, upper side of uh, we call uh, Punjab. There's a big movie hall. Almost every day I go run down there, see Hindi movie. I run up there. <laughs> Maybe that must help me so well. And I managed to come up and down. How naughty I was! This is <laughs> end of eleven trucos. We went to a picnic. It's okay. You describe, we, you you describe, you describe uh, that very well in your book about how, how ingenious you are at being naughty and how you manage to escape and watch the movies and do all these things. Yes. And it's very entertaining. Well, after that, you got you met the Kamapa who was very, he sort of said, you must come with me. And he took you to room check monastery. And can you tell us something about that? So what happens then, uh, because uh, I managed to, uh, wrestle with all this, they broke my arms. And then one of the Atul Rumbuji, now he's in Oxford, he's like my own brother. He says, I know it's no problem. He put something here, dick, 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 dick. my whole arm got broke pieces. Taking down to Ambrasa, they put the big plaster. I just jumped through the window, went to see a movie, <laughs> come up, <laughs> then I knock everybody off like this way. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was a baddy, baddy, baddy. But then coming to, uh, 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 I saw uh, Kamapa in 60s in New Delhi. Uh, my brother wasn't there. I never met Kamapa before. And uh, <coughs> I went to see him there. He just told me, Kamba star, this is a paro center. What are you doing here? Come back to Rumtek. And I could never say no to him. There must be some comic. Because I passed Tibetan administration course, Dharamsala, and I meant to be one of the Dalai Lama's representative in one of the big camp in South India. Instead of going this, I just ran after room thing. Then he locked me up there. But he was kind. He never says I have to do anything. I think he conquered me with kindness. So I sit cross leg. Everybody have such a respect and I never know how to respect him. Sit cross leg. Yes, like ordinary. But he just kept me there. Then he said to me one day, look, this all the lamas, like that's a four region to these trukus, Kinchin Tangram which is teaching in this called relics box from Kamapa to some chambers to Malarepa, very precious place. While they are learning the text, you do prostration here. I thought he is punishing me. 
is punishing me here again. I need to escape. <laughs> so he's upstairs this court. It's about a crown room. Nobody's allowed to go there. He said, I'll give you key there. You have to do a lot of purification. Don't just say, but go there for a station. Then I said to my brother, tell his holiness, I want to come to see you. His holiness says, your brother has nothing to do with you. I own you. Then my brother could not say anything. He's so afraid of Kamapa. So I was waiting opportunity when the Kamapa was invited to go to uh, uh, Bhutan by the king of Bhutan. He took up to almost 100 of lay people. They gave, he made big, big offerings. So he left me and two of his nephews to be uh, in charge of Rumte. And Chujang Pumba, Rumbachi, came back from Bhutan. He came back there because I know him so well. I said, Tumba Rumbachi, this time you have to take me to England with you. <laughs> he said, yes, I'll do this for you. So he went, to, he was staying with Canadian High Commissioner in Delhi. So they are very powerful. The Canada helped India a lot. So uh, I went to Rumtek and that time she came as independent government. So I said, I need 15 days, sort of permit to go out and then come back. And I took that and went to Canada house, used the, their telephone, their connection. I managed to get passport, everything within month. And then I said, I want to go to UK. This is not easy, you have to get visa. So I want to speed it up. How can we do? This is if you pay about that time, rupee is a lot of value, called a lot of rupee. And then if they're okay, you can go straight away. If they say no, uh, then you won't get uh, any chance for long. So I said, okay, money is not my problem because Chujan Tumba has come back from UK. So he has a lot of money. <laughs> I use his money to pay this and then I got a visa. And then my brother sent me a ticket. I went with Chujan Tumba Rumbachi. We didn't go to uh, uh, Scotland. He went to land to Paris. And we stayed in Paris airport. Then I didn't know he has a girlfriend in New uh, New, uh, New Jersey, no, New, uh, near uh, Newcastle University. So he said, we're going to go to this girl's hostel. So we stayed in Newcastle. Then gradually, gradually, we went up there. The police everywhere has got my passport saying, my brother saying, I lost my brother because he is not here. So I become very famous that way. Mm -hmm. I caused a lot of headache, my brother. You describe very well um, Trumpa, you know, his, his, how he got into, how he drank too much and he had too many girlfriends and so on. And it's very, you do it very well uh, without any kind of real criticism as he, because as you say, he was simply behaving as people behaved in the 60s. It's very difficult looking back now to think that that was the normal way of behaving, which it was for the counterculture people. Um, but uh, you also are very good in saying that you were escaping your own training, your own practice. You didn't want to do your own practice, so you came to England to get away from the Karmapa. Yes, yes. Then what happens, uh, came to Samueli, uh, then they come the hippie days. It was a disaster, Samueli have, all these stinking people, long hair, taking drugs, and this was a disaster. So I thought I made the biggest mistake. And I didn't want to come down to the Samuelian shrine room, and I didn't want to eat with them. I just stayed in my room. I have a big video listening to indie music. <laughs> so my brother keep on bringing me food there. The exactly four years, uh, Kamapa was going through uh, London to USA. Then I said to my brother, get me a ticket. I want to go with his oldness, Kamapa. When I met Kamapa in London, he says, that's end of your escape. <laughs> so <laughs> I went with him to USA. Then Chujan Tumba is my very best friend. I really have a respect. He is such a knowledgeable in Dharma. 
perfect English, very good in the Dharma. He has everything. If you are living in Tunga, Tunga, so uh, even separating Akun uh, Tunga helps both sides because when Tunga and uh, my brother stay together, my brother served him. Chujan Tunga does teaching. My brother is like housekeeper. When Chujan Tunga went, my brother's method suited the traditional uh, English sort of way of thinking. So they his activities grow so big. Uh, Tomba's activity in uh, Colorado uh, amount growing very, very fast. Because he has uh, come up, he just spent as much money as ever needed to be. He said, for come up, his holiness, we never compromise. We have to borrow $100,000, uh, we borrow it, spend. And come up, he has a big, big respect. So from there on, <coughs> then come up has 15 old monks. And they never know how to follow rules. That time airport was very loose. They go in, they go out, they go in, they go out. So come up says, now I'm appointing. You're going to be disciplined master to these old monks. <laughs> so I have to make sure these old monks behave themselves. So then that way I never escaped from Kamapa. So then we went with Kamapa uh, from the USA to even Washington DC. Uh, we went to Smithsonian Museum. I actually made the first, <coughs> first man on the moon. He was working in Smithsonian Museum. We were guests of Senator Percy who was introducing the energy bill. We went to senators, uh, senator's dining room. We went to White House. Then uh, from there onwards, we were going up to, uh, uh, across the Los Angeles Zoo. Then we went up to um, uh, where Canada, Vancouver, where British uh, representative there. We went <laughs> flying there. And then from there, we went to Calgary University, uh, come up and talk there and also he started center. So when we in Calgary, then <coughs> he said, myself and this one of his uh, person who we very good friend, saying you two have to come down to American uh, side of Niagara Falls. So we didn't know what he's up to. We went down there, say, then Dr. City Shane, multimillionary Chinese, he said, you are very special, Kamapa. So I'm going to offer you 350,000 hectares in frame site, upstate New York. So you better start your own center. So they come up and says to me and that you two going to start center. He never ever done anything in his life. I never done anything in my life. So we say to each other, one thing we don't want to do is disgrace come up. We will behave so honorably. So they give they give us a very beautiful <coughs> bungalow in uh, we call Long Island Shore. There's massive property there. It's the most expensive property. So his uh, uh, wife's uh, uh, sister is there. She was like his own spy. So we stayed inside the room, never went out, never got girlfriend, never drunk. He went there to learn ballet class. And then Dr. Shane started like me, like his own son. He said, you two are the most noble human being I've ever seen. He sponsored many Chinese uh, because when he's there, they're very cold to him. When he goes away, they behave badly. So from there on, I was in his good book. So did, I did succeed. So I was able to start the Kamatri and a big monastery. I'm responsible for that. And then from there on, uh, I took the highest ordination and went in the retreat. You, do, you describe very well how you reached a sort of rock bottom stage in your life and then you decided to take the rope. Yes. I thought that was very moving. Could you say something about that? Well, what, what happens is that because I have only two options, because I was so successful, Kamatriana, now we managed by the, this most beautiful property in East Coast, 
Mid Mountain Road, and we have a lot of people coming, going. So my brother said to me, now you served, uh, come up very well. Can you come back to help me? Because I've too many activities to, uh, to do. And the Kamatiri and the people did not want me to uh, go. So I'm sort of caught in between. So then something he says to me, I said to Ripi Doji, it was very uh, special day. If you give me highest bhikkhu ordination in this special day, I'll become a bhikkhu. And then because I behave so badly for so long, I have no trust I can actually manage to keep the vow. <coughs> I go into long-term retreat. He knows everything. So he said, okay, uh, you come with me to Washington, D.C. Then when we finish that, uh, I go to Vermont, then you go back to retreat. What happens in KTD? The day I took ordination, because I have a flight I have to give to my brother, and I sleep in the tent with one other lama, there's a very beautiful Zen woman. She's chasing me. She said, I want to sleep with you. So I was running everywhere and went to some other room nobody knows. So I think this is how dangerous it is. So I locked in myself to go to Rujit. Then when I'm Rujit, I felt so guilty. I could not focus. I was so bad. So Chabje Kala Rumbuche was supposed to be the best Rujit master. He told me, you're very stupid to me being. You, when you're a lay person, there is nothing you can't do. Now you come to retreat, you are mourning there. He said, you have to practice from morning till evening. Read Mla Repa's book. Then I go to Kempo Katha Rinpoche and bring the Mla Repa's book. Then really my tears come down. I thought, no, then now I'll die of practicing Dhamma. So I got up almost two, three, uh, uh, two or three hours from morning till evening, almost every day, 100 uh, pro, thousand pro stations, 1,000 pro stations every day. So my joint have, like knees have whole, hand have a whole. Uh, I went in the retreat very fat. I was so skinny. I don't hear anything much. But due to this strong, strong practicing, then finally, I seem to have come in my mind. So I have to go through really, really hard time for five whole years. And you did a, you did a, um, a three year retreat, didn't you? No, there for almost five years. Five then years. My, mm. yeah, then my brother wanted me to come back because uh, my uh, two sisters, and my one old brother from Tibet was allowed to get permission to come to see me, but USA won't give them visa to come to uh, I mean, uh, New York. So he said, you have to come to see them. Once I'm there, then he said, now you're not going back anymore. When you go there, then you don't write to us, I worry. So you want to go to the street, I'll give you a room. So this is how he giving to me. Then ever since I've been here, and then he started to teach us. I've been helping them. So actually I've been benefiting him very much. And now I have a lot of experience with dealing with other people. And I have done three successive dark routines. So I've done many practice. Mm. And then finally you came back to England then. Yeah, yeah, from USA 84, came back to Scotland. They never allowed to go back there. And then, and then there was you and you and Ak and Akon in in uh, in Sami Ling, and could you say something about how what happened with with Akon? He went to China, didn't he? Um, so what happens is because he really wanted to ban people who help them, and also is very very strong in Tibetan nationalist uh, uh, sort of culture tradition. So there's very very famous Kempo right now, or Kempo Sutem Lodu Rinpoche, in a way there's uh, tens of 20,000 monks, nuns, they got very good friends and they start, uh, so 
he managed to raise more than 30 million pounds to start hundreds of different schools, education centers. And I saw even uh, the event school he started when you go there, they all come out and dance and sing in Chinese. He said in front of a Chinese official, I give you money to keep our culture alive. You co ask, give me a welcoming Trachy Derek, or if you welcome me in Chinese, I'll not give you one penny. So he become very, very fearless. And he been doing this ever since. And there's hundreds of thousands of Tibetans, monasteries, Gilupas, Nyingmapas, Sachapas, Bhambu, who didn't care in schools, he just helped whoever need to be helped. And then he was so successful. So final stage, of, the Chinese said, uh, he is invited to Lhasa. There's some other Tibetans, they, when they went to Lhasa, some 50th anniversary or something, then Chinese says, you all get up and you have to say bad things about Dalai Lama. He says, I'm Tibetan Buddhist Lama. I can never say bad things about Dalai Lama in my life. The, the Chinese officials say, go sit down, don't come up. They, I think they are honored. I think he got the death sentence. So when he went back to Tendu, somebody had assassinated him. You're, you're very good about saying that, you know, the real, that although you, when you were brought up, you were brought up in a, a, a village without any electric light or with any of the modern facilities, but the village had everything that was really important, all the real values were in their village and that the materialist culture that China was trying to bring in actually destroyed the real values that was in, the, in Tibet and, and was owned by the people and was practiced and developed by the people through their religion and their customs. The, the materialism that China attempts to bring, in fact, has destroyed everything of real value. Yes, that's what the communists see this now. So the uh, introducing, they say, the Chinese, all the communists believe in Buddhism, but the Chinese and Buddhism is like very flowery, no meaning. So they said Chinese and Buddhism, they recognize, they don't recognize Tibetan Buddhism, but because the Setan campus in uh, Tibet, there are thousands of them teaching in China, teaching all in inch, uh, Chinese language. There are, we think 300 million of them are really proper uh, Tibetan Buddhist believers and practitioners. <coughs> so the Tibetan Buddhism is taking all over the place because I never grudge Chinese people. Chinese and people on Tibetan have connections for thousands of years. So we are, Lamas are good in providing, nourishing them with loving kindness, Dharma teaching, they have other skills. So, even his holiness, Dalai Lama said, we will never ask, completely independent. They built a nice road, the comfortable place, but they have no beliefs. So uh, Tibetan beliefs are necessary. So <laughs> Tibetan believers benefit many, many more people. So I'm trying to tell all the Europeans, materialists is no value. Look, nowadays, even a lot of people who have a lot of money in the bank, they're now worried they're going to lose everything they have in the bank. And if you have so much money, what is useful? So I'm hearing we have been planting over 45,000 trees. Buddhists are all very renowned to take care of environment. We have to look after animals. We have to respect all life forms as equal not to take a life form or kill or harm, planting a lot of trees. And I am very fortunate to human being. So I now have one of the biggest project in the Cape Town area called Cedar Peak, uh, three, 300, hectares. 300 hectares of prime site where these wild animals and unspoiled land is going to be dedicated to world heritage. And another 3,000 hectares of land, we're going to make a joint there. So it will be all preserving because there's all the source of water up there. So <coughs> if Cape Town ever dries, it can provide all the water. So 
we're doing a lot of more environmental job. Mm. There's, there's, um, I realize that sort of time is passing, but um, your book is really, is a really inspiring thing to read. And I found it both inspiring, despite the fact having been in Buddhism for many years, inspiring and profoundly moving at times. And it's really, it's written in the very simplest of language, you know, about how, you know, first of all, you describe how you were resistant and how you felt angry at various people. And slowly you had to face that. And then once you had faced it and you uh, started really practicing seriously, how all those feelings dropped away, all your feelings of resentment and anger. And you suddenly felt a new person coming into, into life. So I think I suggest that every one of us, sometimes we say we find space to forgive others, but we don't find space to forgive one oneself. That is very self-destructive. So I suggest that always learn to forgive yourself. Remind yourself, say, why not you forgive yourself? If you don't forgive yourself, how can you become a positive, a better human being? So learning to forgive yourself as well as learning to forgive others, always remembering to evolve for better fulfillment, better for benefit of all mother sentient beings. Never, never to discriminate. Always you learn to accept. So uh, uh, sometimes we have been asked by the, some question group saying, can you please uh, repeat uh, Mother Mary's name? Uh, I have to repeat three times a day. I thought there's nothing wrong. She must be also Buddhisattva. <laughs> and uh, this is a lot. My Buddha says, Buddhisattva can be any form or shape. You need to judge by what they do action. If they have others in their mind, then one's own self. Whatever they do, benefit others are more important. So I would like all those who are participating in this uh, to benefit listening to me by learning to remain positive, guide that mind, not let it to go old cow's way, but start to build a new path that means feeling good, being able to do something good, but always transfer from me into others. And that is a major change. And I want to really thank you, Desmond, and your wife. You're so very, very kind. Both of you have been so nice to me. I know all of you a very long time. And keep on doing your wonderful job because you are the umbrella organization of all the Buddhist schools. So I think due to how it's set up, you gain that respect. And I think if we can all walk, I always, I actually practice it even better the other uh, the monks. I don't eat anything after noon. I don't eat any meat. I practice, I meditate. So actually I got a, a quite big title from Sri Lanka Congress of Sangha. So I visited uh, uh, Thailand, Mbama, Sri Lanka everywhere. So, I have such a good connection to the other school. My son is in London, uh, big shrine and drums, downstairs. I said it's all Buddhist school because there's a statue of Lord Buddha and uh, his two attendants and six, 16 arahat. They have more, no more crazy <laughs> Tibetan Buddhist statues. Tara or Genesis. It's upstairs. So I always have something open for everybody. Thank you very much. There's, another, there's a question here from a member of the audience. Yes. Um, it comes from, um, I think it's from, let's just see who, who it is, from Lee Hill. He mm -hmm. says, Dear Lama Yeshe Losa Rinpoche, your book is very honest and I'm very grateful for you sharing these feelings and emotions as many people will be able to relate to this book. He says, sometimes people wake up right now feeling anxious and depressed. What things can people do in the morning to brighten their day? Always remember to say, as soon as you uh, wake up, you think, 
how fortunate I am. I'm not dead. So today I'm going to engage something positive, way of thinking, engaging, how I can help, what can I do? Like uh, I was uh, seeing the national health was going through such a difficult time. So I was able to donate them 25,000 pounds for their uh, national health service. Uh, similarly, we have 44, five sanghas. We look after ourselves. We close every door to everybody because we have many elderly people. We care more about their life than money. So Samili has been managing without need to open or make money. So it's like we should always remember to help. So when you get up, always thinking, I'm fortunate, I'm fortunate. When you go to sleep, then if you really want, say, I take a refuge to Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, then concentrate this on your heart chakra. So even sleeping, you can create a good karma. The question here, it's from Philip Nowak. And he mm. says, my best friend is here as well and listening. And her mother is at the hospital at the moment because of the virus and she is very sick. Mm. They're worrying a lot. Is there mm. something they should try to keep in mind during this very challenging time? And could you please say a prayer for her? I've been helping people like this all the way. If she is not well, then you always remind her how she is, how she is. And also you get stress. It doesn't benefit her. It doesn't benefit you. So you have to say, mother, best is we can all pray. And you learn to accept your sickness. The minute you learn to accept sickness, Buddha says that time your pain is reduced. So I have many people who have a cancer, different sickness. They learn to my, uh, learn to have my method. This is, it sometimes even cures them. So he should not worry. He should pray for her. They not remind her again and again, how are you, how are you? Not need to say, you just say, we are with you. We are with you. So if she is a believer of Christianity, you say this is time to pray for God. Or if she is believer of Buddhism, this time to pray for Buddha. So let's help whatever belief there is to increase that. Thank you very much. There's another one here from um, Lama Yeshe. Could you please give us some advice about how to live in acceptance of the increasing pollution and poisoning of our natural environment that we must live with? Thank you from the depth of my heart for taking this time for us. We can all take responsibility. So I have many, many young people. As soon as I see somebody, I say, I'm going to be appointing you as my ambassador to do the healing of the Mother Earth. So because due to this corona disease, not many aeroplanes flying. So ozone layer is supposed to be much better than ever before. Then there's some forms of life. So we, instead of us worry about the pollution, all the water going through things wrong, we should do everything in our power how to change it. So consume less energy. So I was talking in a Zoom with a, a high Scottish interfaith council. So they're saying, what we do, we have, we have old church or Senegal. I said, that's easy. You just change bulb for uh, uh, this LED so it doesn't consume any light. And you put this automatic. So when any people come say switch on, it's switch off. We can improve insulation. So there's so many things we can do to improve the environment, needing less, wanting less, not to uh, take anything which is not given to you. Never, never to hurt animals. Never, never to consume animals. What right do we have to eat them? So we should learn to eat vegetables, simplicity. So my big my vow is that uh, I eat breakfast, very simple breakfast, a lunchtime something, 
until tomorrow morning, I have nothing. So we don't have to have so many foods, especially before going into sleep. Some of your habits, you have a big, big dinner, then it makes you sleep, you get headache. The, all your food eating has no benefit. So stop eating heavy food before going to bed. <laughs> Just light food, Buddhism we say, when you don't have much food, you wake up morning very bright. A rising energy, degracing energy from a rising morning till afternoon, that everything we practice goes up very uh, successfully. They, as soon as day breaks, uh, going down energy. So uh, if you put a lot of effort, there's less benefit. So I suggest some of the habit we have to change. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let's hope we can put some of those things into practice. Now, there's another one from Charlene. Um, during this COVID period, it's emotionally very challenging. And how can we achieve emotional resilience? The way I've been talking is this is a method. If you sit there, idle mind, this mind get into problems. If you engage your mind, like if you're really want to uh, have a good healthy body. Nowadays, people taking walk, going out there, challenge as far as you can walk. So physically you lose the weight, you become stronger. And then even you sit, don't watch too many things. You can, if you're Buddhist, you can recite mantra, you can do prostration. If you're non-Buddhist, read the books, which has a belief in the faith, you need to have a, faith also. So you need to have all this to change. Yes, do you want, to, there's a question here about faith and they ask, could you say a little bit about faith? Faith is absolutely essential. Without faith, nothing can function. So, but faith is not ultimate. Faith with effort. You have a strong faith that there's nothing you can't do. Uh, whichever faith you believe, they going to help you to deliver this uh, change in your life and benefit others. So change with effort is necessary. Faith is necessary. Without faith, they, that means you don't have any sort of expectation to change or hope you can't change anything. That's no good. Yes, thank you very much. That's true. It's, it underlies everything, doesn't it? Um, yes, yes, yes. There's a question here, which is complimenting you on your memory. You're having such a good, clear memory of all the things that have happened to you. And also thanking you for your book, which is deeply inspiring and moving. Um, there's another question here is sometimes I wake up feeling gloomy in the morning. What can I do to stop that feeling of depression? I think that's what I'm trying to say. say don't sleep with sort of a sort of very dull state of mind. As soon as you wake up, you jump up and wash your clean with cold water, uh, do exercise, practice, have a faith. They say, I'm going to change for better. Like uh, uh, I uh, am 77 years, no years old now. I have a back problem, can't stand upright properly. But I get up almost like, can't sleep more than two and a half hours. So I get up, I wash myself, I do exercise, I do practice two, three, four hours, engaging and praying, chanting for well being for all. I look into the window, I recite mantra, telling the, all the animals don't become ignorant because when you're ignorant, you're born as animal. So I pray for them, saying, Bodhisattva, Pancho Chenese, please liberate us from this stupidity and ignorance. So don't stay in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know how much time you have. Have you time for more questions? Well, because I did say I'll give you uh, any time you want. Uh, it's uh, uh, 18 minutes. So up to 20 minutes, yeah, I can give you a few more minutes. Yes. OK. Well, there is another question saying, Yeshe, thank you very much for your, for your splendid talk. and. Um, do you still do prostrations? 
that I can't even get up right. So I am wobbly. So how can I do prostration? See, that's the problem. Yes. <laughs> but there are plenty of other practices to be done besides prostration. Yes, because uh, at, uh, like our mind is like glue. We have to free ourselves from glue. Means doje sempa, Buddha doje sempa is purification. So we recite hundred syllable mantra. Doji sempa is best. So I do more doji sempa. I can't do prostration because actually I almost broke my uh, the kneecaps. So now I have to do knee exercise, have muscles because I may not have kneecaps anymore. See. <laughs> Um, I'm like a Japanese kamakazi, because kambas always say, either you kill yourself for dharma or either you kill yourself for be a bad robber. <laughs> yes, sir. You, you, your book is, is, is a wonderful description, really, of how, you know, a young person who has no real spiritual feeling at the beginning, you have obviously a capacity for joy and happiness, and a lot of ability to be naughty when you were young, but no real spiritual thing. But gradually through the course of your life, the whole spiritual world begins to open up for you. And here you are, you know, at, at your age now, running a, probably the most important monastery in England, you know, the, probably the biggest Buddhist monastery as the abbot. And what, what do you... What do you think on that when you reflect? I, I get sometimes choked myself. A guy who come here not even knowing the culture, tradition, proper English, when I first came to uh, UK uh, as a 60, uh, 69, people say don't shave, otherwise they think you are a prisoner. And now I'm so highly respected. I thought, how can I get into not knowing even proper English? I was a uh, uh, a Majesty's uh, Queen's uh, Golden Jubilee invited to Buckingham Palace. I went to Prince Charles' place. I know all the royal family. I know most of the politicians because something joy makes people happy to talk to and see. And so you need to increase joy. The knowing many things, very elegant language, knowing many things. That person have a lot of, uh, we call ego and judgment mind. So even you want to be top in some way, you can't get anyway. So I'm just amazed by thinking, one who have never been to school, I don't even know how to write proper spelling. <laughs> Yet I'm zooming here and there everywhere. If you look into, there is a, I have a zoom, uh, in some in a zoom, you can see something in guided too. It is a massive size. So I have many like this place around the world. So it's just like I have a fortune in my hand. So I even never think where the money is going to come, how I'm going to achieve all this. Something blessing comes. So I'm just eager to share, eager to give. What I say, jimba jimba, giving time, giving space, giving energy. Even sharing positiveness is very good wealth to offer. Good, thank you. There's a very interesting question here. Dear Lama Yeshi, thank you for your time and knowledge. And I'm, I too am from a collective culture, growing up with very close family and simple things. How would you recommend sharing that with people in the Western world who are very individualistic and don't really understand that side of things? Buddha teaching says, first you learn to uh, get along with yourself, then you can uh, learn to deal with your close family friends, then you can extend this automatically, so it just, uh, just <coughs> grows, so we don't need to make any effort, just learn to get along, then get along with your family, so like we call many, many Jewish people around the world, then many of them called Jubos, Jewish Buddhists, because they think they practicing Buddhism makes them a better Jewish. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think it makes you a better whatever you are. <laughs> Buddhism makes you, it's that ingredient, that special thing that makes you, whatever you do makes you better at it. And better. Not 
other people better if you can't able to change your thing. So I am product. If you say uh, old times, my book tells you that Jamra is now, I think no longer Jamra anymore. Now this is called Lama. This is my second incarnation. See? Yeah. <laughs> So we can have a, a two incarnation, three incarnation, one lifetime. Yeah, it is. It is extraordinary. It's it is an extraordinary journey that you've been on. It's uh, quite amazing, really, from an unknown tiny village in an unknown part of the world. I mean, in 1959, hardly anyone even knew that Tibet existed. It was a completely unknown place, and it's an amazing journey that you've made. I mean, not just geographically into another country and learn another language, learn another culture, but also a transformation of a person. Yes, I want to credit this all to His Holiness Dalai Lama because His Holiness has been teaching loving kindness to the around the world. So they learn to accept the Tibetan faith because they don't know where Tibet is, but now they know who Dalai Lama is. For my personally, my root teacher, Kamapa, my brother, one is like, we call Tukji Chakju means Kamapa was like a good fisher person. He hooked me up and I could not be released. <laughs> my brother was solid like Mount Everest. Doesn't matter whatever way I want to roll out, he won't let me out. So I actually didn't have much choice but I have to get some way. So I've been forcefully put up there. So it must be my good karma. And I wish all of you will have that, but based on your own choice, saying that our new civilization will not get us anyway. We need to take less from the mother earth, star means earth, water may, fire, wind, they are our life. So we have to help them healing. So Hindu uh, belief, uh, Sanskrit, and Buddhist is almost similar. We have to have these five elements, some time to do healing. So we should consume less, need less, want less. We should all plant trees. We should all dedicate save less money. Some wealthy people have billions of money they don't give to the National Health Service. They still say, I want the government to subsidize. That is very ignorant. We are all suffering. A corona disease have no boundary. That's called interconnectedness. But this same is everything's interconnectedness. There's no way one can escape. So uh, there is no separation. So we see that interconnectedness makes us all work harder and harder, means less selfishness. And I wish all of you very best and learn to take care of yourself, always knowing I'll make sure I can help other human beings, wish to help other people. And I want to really thank you Desmututo and your magazine, your wife, everybody who are connected there. And we will do everything to help you to make and succeed and keep Tibetan, this Buddhist society strong as ever before. And uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhists seem to be naturally growing everywhere. So there's nothing one can stop. So we are going to be joined together to work and bring Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, his teaching to the world. Yes. And I want to thank all of you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. And can I just say as a last word, thank you, Yeshe, for your time, yes. for your patience, for your book, for your life, and for all the things that you've done for us and continue to do. Thank you I, so much. I commit to myself. Till I'm dead, I'm never going to stop helping. So I said, what will stop me doing good is I'm dead. Tell that nothing will stop me. And so if anybody wants to hear more, we are also recorded here. If you want to uh, clearly, we can send you recording. 
Yeah, this will be on a this will be on a recording, and it will be on uh, available for people to see. But can I say as a last word, if you want to be really inspired, it's a wonderful read. I picked up the book. I couldn't put it down. I read it in one go, from one cover to the other. Six hours, six and a half hours. I read it from cover to cover. So read the book. It's a wonderful book. And thank you, Yeshi. Thank you for being you from the, from all of us here at the Buddhist Society. Thank you very, very much. And long may your health continue. May you continue in your with your work and your, your life and con contributing to the Dharma. Same to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.